on September 29th, 2001, just a few weeks after the attacks of 9-11. Abdo Ali Ahmed, a Muslim American citizen originally from the country of Yemen, began his day as he usually would, opening his small convenience store in Fresno County, California at 7 a.m. sharp. Despite finding a death threat scrawled on his windshield just two days before, Ahmed went about his business as usual, selling coffee and cigarettes to locals on the way to work. At approximately 4.15 that afternoon, two boys entered his convenience store and proceeded to fatally shoot the 51-year-old man. As police investigated the incident, they immediate, immediately identified the incident as a hate crime because no merchandise had been stolen from the store. When the funeral service was held, Muhammad Raka, a community leader, spoke on the tragedy of Ahmed's death, saying that he was just one more victim of the tragedy of 9-11. Raka left those gathered with one important question, when will the terror end? In the events of 9-11, the, the events of 9-11 left the American people sad, angry, and searching for change and answers. In response to the chaos that swept across the country, President George W. Bush addressed a joint session of Congress that was broadcast nationwide on September 20th. Near the beginning of his 15-minute address, when describing the events of the past nine days, Bush says that Americans have seen the unfurling of flags, the lighting of candles, and the, and the giving of blood as a unified response to one of the worst terrorist attacks in world history. In this description, the president utilizes pathos through the use of imagery by evoking a sense of pride and protection for our country. Later, Bush identifies these terrorists as enemies of freedom who committed an act of war against our country. And later, he also identifies these terrorists that are affiliated with a fringe of Islamic extremism. By depicting these terrorists as enemies of freedom, he uses pathos by alluding to the fact that they're attacking the freedom that's personal to us, which is the foundational element of our country. As he goes on to explain that those responsible for the attacks are affiliated with Islam, he also leaves Muslims vulnerable to intolerance and discrimination. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, intolerance is defined as the unwillingness to accept beliefs, views, or behaviors that are different from your own. Just as freedom has been a foundation in our country since the beginning, intolerance and discrimination have been rooted in the nation's rhetoric and action since its birth. In recent history, African Americans and the KKK have been two such groups that have been subject to intolerance and discrimination. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, when, Americans, when American racism fu fueled hatred towards blacks and segregation ran wild throughout the South, African Americans were in fear of their lives as racially related hate crimes were on the rise. After African Americans were granted civil rights in 1964 by the Civil Rights Act, the nation's primary focus of, of intolerance shifted towards those groups that opposed the African Americans' rights, especially the KKK. As the equality of United States citizens became more widely accepted, the targets for the Americans' widespread intolerance had to shift. The historic events of September 11, 2001, served as a catalyst for a similar shift. The public's focus then turned towards Muslims. Once Bush's address on September 20th exposed the Islamic affiliation of the 9-11 terrorists, the Americans have found a new home for their discrimination. So people began to speak of and treat Muslims differently. At airports, Muslims were and continue to be subjects of racial and religious profiling which includes extensive, extensive searching, questioning, and possible detainment 
just because they look Muslim. If you and I were at an airport and we saw a Muslim looking person or a Middle Eastern looking person being taken aside by a TSA representative, we're going to assume the worst simply because of the affiliation between Muslims and what happened in 9-11 with airplanes. Without this connection that Bush identified in his speech, the tentative and presumptive treatment of Muslims may not even exist. In the wake of the attacks, the Islam bar the barrage of media coverage on is Islam-related things um, portrayed Islam as, a, as just a religion that, that promoted violence towards the West. Some Muslims were even afraid to identify in clothing, make Muslim references, or even go to mosque because of the generalizations that connected them to violence. In addition to generalizing Muslims, the media also displayed a bias when reporting on uh, incidents of terrorism following 9-11. In 2002, Luke Helder, a white student from Minnesota, set off numerous pipe bombs throughout the Midwest. And but, except when CNN covered these events, he was, they portrayed him as an intelligent young man with strong family ties, and even blamed his misbehavior on mental health issues. On the other hand, Muslim terrorists, like one that opened fire on a U.S. military recruitment office in 2009, was portrayed as an angry extremist who turned towards violence in the form of revenge. Muslims are thought of as our enemies and perceived threat to our safety. Looking back on our country's history, there is an indisputable cycle of intolerance towards various groups. As the public's interest fades towards one group, it always seems to shift towards another. It's important that we, as Americans, attempt to, t attempt to stop this cycle by identifying the outliers within the groups that these outliers claim to be a part of. Hate terrorists, not Muslims. Thank you very much.